The last couple of months since February, um, commentary on this channel has been dominated by events in Ukraine. The last couple of weeks since, well, to a certain extent since August, but perhaps most probably, most focally since November, has been dominated by dis discussion of the battles in the Bakhmut Solidar area. And the last couple of days, the focus has been on the battles specifically in and around Solidar. And that pattern is going to continue with this particular video. Now, yesterday I reported the claims that were being made by various Russian officials, specifically by Yevgeny Prigozhin, the um, erstwhile head of the Wagner organization, that his troops had taken control of essentially the entire metropolitan area of Solidar. Now, this was immediately challenged, or very soon after challenged, by um, various Ukrainian officials who insisted that fighting was still going on in Solidar and who went on to give the impression that control of the town is still contested. I think that people who talk in this way are not paying much attention or specific attention to what Prigozhin said, and I accept when I say that, that Prigozhin perhaps in his comments um, gilded the, lit the lily, as we say in Britain, a little, but overall Prigozhin said that Solidar as a whole is under the control of the troops of his Wagner organization, but he did say that there, is, that there are holdouts in various places, Ukrainian holdouts in various places, and that fighting is therefore, in some of those places, still continuing. He spoke specifically of a cauldron, that is to say, a tight entrapment of some Ukrainian troops in the center of Solidar. He didn't exactly say where in the center. Um, and. There's also been some reports that there's Ukrainian troops still holding out in the Seoul railway station at the western end of Solidar and in some of the outer suburbs of Solidar. And that has never been disputed. And I would say that as of today, some fighting is still taking place in Solidar. But it's important to understand what the nature of that fighting is. It's not fighting, so far as I can see, to contest control of the town. It is fighting basically to clear out these holdouts to bring all Ukrainian resistance within Solidar to an end. Once that happens, and it will probably happen over the next couple of days, day or so, the Russian Ministry of Defense will formally confirm that the town is under Russian control. The practice of the Russian government, the Russian authorities, is to wait until all resistance, all resistance, in a place has been completely broken before formally announcing physical control of the place. And that, I suspect, is what is going to happen in Solidar. When you read reports in the Western media or from Ukrainian sources which give you the impression that fighting in Solidar is still taking place, well, that is factually true. But it doesn't seem to me that it is accurate to say that the fighting means that the town, the control of the town, is contested. By the way, on that point, I'm going to say something further. I don't know to what extent the Ukrainian authorities in Kiev have any communications with the troops, Ukrainian troops who may still be holding out in odd places within Solidar, and most of whom are probably surrounded. But if they do, then it seems to me that as a humanitarian responsibility, they should order those troops to lay down their weapons and to surrender themselves to the Russians 
and to the Wagner Group. If these men go on fighting, the only outcome, it seems to me, is that they will be captured and perhaps will, or wounded, and in some cases they will be killed. And given, as I said, that the town is essentially under Russian control, that death, those deaths, were they to happen, would be deaths to no military purpose. It would be profoundly shocking, but I'm afraid entirely consistent with um, the pattern of this war. If Ukrainian soldiers were left to die so that officials in Kiev and journalists in some newspapers could go on claiming that a town is contested, control of a town is contested, when to all intents and purposes it no longer is. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about this. What is going on, not just in Solidar, but in the entire area of the battlefields? Now, alongside all these dramatic developments in Solidar, there's also there was also a report yesterday that the village of Opitnoye to the south of Bakhmut has now also been fully captured by the assault forces of the Wagner organization. Now, if that is true, and I want to stress again, this is these are reports, there's not been any complete confirmation of this, but if that is true, then I would say that it is at least as important as the fall of Solidar itself. Obviously, Opitnoye is a very small place. It's hardly on the scale of Solidar, but it does sit astride the access road to Bakhmut from the south. Now, I suspect, given that there's been fighting in Opitnoye for several weeks, it's most unlikely that Ukraine has been sending troops or supplies into Bakhmut via this road. They would have to pass through all the fighting to get to Bakhmut. But it does mean that we're closer now to a complete entrapment, a cauldron, if you prefer, being created around the Ukrainian troops still in Bakhmut. And it also means that Rus Russian troops, Wagner organization troops in Opitnoye, provided they're able to secure the place from Ukrainian counterattacks, which is still likely, by the way. But once they've secured the place from Ukrainian counterattacks, can concentrate on advancing in two directions. First, towards Klesheyevka, this village between Opitnoye and Ivanovka, which the Russians need to control if they are to capture Ivanovka, and then, of course, on Ivanovka itself, which sits astride of the main road to Bakhmut from the west. And, of course, if that happens, if Opitnoye, Ivanovka, and the Krasnaya Gora in the north of Bakhmut, between Bakhmut and Solidar, all come under Russian control, then I think at that point we are justified in talking about a cauldron in Bakhmut for all the Ukrainian troops that are still there, um, provided, of course, the Ukrainians decide to keep their troops there instead of doing what I think they should be doing, which is pull out. Now, I want to stress again these reports about the capture by the Russians of Opitnoye are not fully confirmed. They did come from sources which I consider to be, on balance, reliable, but we'll have to wait for more confirmation, which we may get over the course of the day. Now, yesterday I said that there was a lot of confused reporting about the fighting in, north, uh, in the northeastern areas of Bakhmut, it wasn't clear to me whether Krasnaya Gora, the other village which is close to the road um, to Bakhmut from the north, whether that village 
had in fact been captured by the Wagner organization troops. There were some reasons to think that he might have been, but there'd be no announcement or report about his capture from any side. My impression today is that Krasnaya Gora is still contested, that there are still Ukrainian troops there, and that they're still putting up a fight, and that though I expect Krasnaya Gora to be very much the next target for um, Russian offensive action in and around Bakhmut, once the situation in Solidar is fully consolidated, I think it is premature to say that the Russians control Krasnaya Gora for the moment. Anyway, you can see now that all the, the trends are now clearly pointing, not just to a relatively small cauldron that's been created in Solidar, and I'm going to discuss that shortly, but potentially a much bigger cauldron, entrapment of Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut itself. And by the way, I ought to add that the fall of Opitnoye, um, if it has taken place, which I suspect it has, and the likely fall of Krasnaya Gora, which I expect to happen within the next week or 10 days or two weeks or so, that all of this also provides entry points for Wagner organization troops to start, and Russian troops, to start entering deeper into Bakhmut itself from different directions. And it's perhaps worth pointing out that this is what essentially happened in Solidar. When Bakhmutsky, a village, suburb, if you like, of Solidar, to the east of Solidar, was captured by the forces, the assault forces of the Wagner organization. It provided a routeway for the assault troops of that organization to break into Solidar itself. And when they did that, and the lines of defense around Solidar were essentially broken, resistance in Solidar quickly unraveled. So we are, or so it seems to me, looking at a severe operational crisis for the Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut. Now, what are the Ukrainians doing in response? Well, President Zelensky yesterday made defiant statements that Ukraine is still holding out in Solidar. And I've discussed today about how one could argue that that was so, there are still Ukrainian troops there. They're still putting up resistance, though this isn't in any sense a real battle, at least not with the troops who are there in the area. These are basically fragmented small groups of fighters trapped inside Solidar, um, facing capture or death unless they take the obvious step of surrendering. And by the way, whilst I'm on that point, uh, some Russian reports are claiming that hundreds of them are indeed surrendering and have been doing so over the course of the last few hours. But I get, must stress, I haven't seen very much in the way of confirmation of this. But anyway, it may be true that there's still fighting going on in Solidar, but it's not fighting to contest control of the town in the way that it seems to me, President Zelensky, um, the impression that, which it seemed to me was the impression that President Zelensky sought to give. However, there are reports that as the situation of the Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut and Solidar, has suddenly and dramatically deteriorated. The Ukrainian response is not to order a pullback from Bakhmut, and we're going to discuss the logic of that in a moment. It is to rush reserves to the area. 
Apparently more Ukrainian troops are being hurriedly sent to try to plug the gaps in the battle lines. And I've even heard some suggestions that the Ukrainians are trying to build up some kind of an assault force to try to retake Solidar. Now, I'm going to say straight away that if they try to do that, I think they will not recapture Solidar, though war is always an unpredictable thing, and I wouldn't in any way discount that possibility entirely, but I think it's most unlikely that they would succeed. But what they would definitely do is that they would incur much heavier losses. They would lose many men, many machines, in what I am sure would be a fruitless undertaking. Even by even if, because of some errors on the Russian side or because of inadequate Russian deployments or something of that kind, even if the Ukrainians were able to recapture Solidar, frankly, the losses that they would incur in doing so would be out of proportion to the outcome. And again, it would only delay the course of the battle. It might provide some nice headlines <clears throat> to uh, repeat in the Western media, but it would only make the overall position of the Ukrainian forces worse. And by the way, there's a report today which I cannot confirm, but it again comes from some sources which I consider to be reasonably reliable, that in order to find these reserves, Ukraine is stripping its defences along the border with Belarus. Not so much the defences around Kiev itself, where on the contrary the Ukrainians are reinforcing and are building fortifications, but the defences near the town of Chernigov in uh, northern Ukraine, which was at one time in March essentially encircled by the Russian army. And it's been suggested that if the Russians want to launch an offensive in that direction towards Chernigov and Sumy and all of these places which played an important role in the fighting in March, well, they would find little resistance this time from the Ukrainians there. And of course, that would deepen Ukraine's operational crisis if they were to find themselves on under attack from multiple fronts. I'm going to discuss this all shortly. Anyway, it does look to me, and this I have to say again, as if Ukraine, far from accepting the military logic of the situation in Solidar and Bakhmut, which points overwhelmingly towards a withdrawal, is on the contrary doubling down and reinforcing failure, throwing more lives of more of its men, more of its machines, more of its forces into what is so brutally referred to now by multiple sources, by the Russians, by the Ukrainians themselves, by sections of the Western me media as the Bakhmut meat grinder. And I should say it's a particularly distressing thing if you follow the news from Solidar to the extent that I have been doing. I'm seeing more and more pictures and more and more film of the battlefields around Solidar and Bakhmut, but especially around Solidar now, littered with dead bodies of soldiers. Now, I'm not in a position myself to identify the identity of these bodies, but overwhelmingly the reports say that they are Ukrainian, and I've no doubt that that is the case. So that's the pattern. And I'm going to say something else. I'm hearing all kinds of very disturbing reports, both from Ukrainian and Russian sources, about the extent of Ukrainian losses in the fighting in Solidar. This is not the Bakhmut Solidar battlefield, but Solidar itself. It seems that one brigade of 
airborne troops, paratroopers in other words, I presume. Anyway, airborne troops, an elite brigade, supposedly one which received some training in the United Kingdom, has essentially been destroyed in the latest fighting in Solidar. They were the troops who were trying to defend Solidar at the very end. That brigade has apparently been largely destroyed. Again, I'm not able to verify this, but that's what the reports say, and it seems to be true. And I've seen one report, which I think came from a Ukrainian source, that overall, over the course of the fighting in Solidar, 14 Ukrainian battalions have been destroyed. Now, 14 battalions would be something like 7,000 men. I'm not suggesting that all of these people have been killed. But anyway, you get a sense of the damage that has been done there. And those are from Ukrainian sources. Russian sources, of course, put the numbers much higher. Now, I'm not going to get into a debate about numbers of casualties in the Bakhmut Solidar area. I don't have the means to do that. I don't have the information. But... It overall paints a grim picture. And yesterday in my program, I read out um, an interview provided by a Ukrainian soldier to CNN who was saying that even Ukrainian soldiers who are, have been tasked with the job of defending Solidar have lost track of the numbers of losses that they are experiencing, that their unit is being continuously diluted by draftees as the more professional soldiers have been killed. And since Solidar is undefendable, and since the soldiers know that sooner or later it has been abandoned, there's considerable uncertainty, even amongst some of the soldiers, as to why it is that they're making this sacrifice in Solidar to defend a town which is going to be defended inevitably and eventually, abandoned inevitably and intentionally. Well, that was a Ukrainian soldier. Now, apparently, I say apparently because I'm not a subscriber to the Wall Street Journal, but apparently there's been an article in the Wall Street Journal which has been saying essentially the same thing. It says that some Western military commentators, I'm not sure who these people are, but I'm guessing that they're ma mainly American, are becoming concerned or have been getting increasingly concerned about the over-investment that Ukraine has been making in defending Bakhmut and Solidar, that they've been questioning the logic of the military logic of trying to cling on to these two places with all the enormous losses that this incurs and have been suggesting that the better policy for Ukraine would be to pull its troops out of Bakhmut and Solidar and to try to create new defence lines on higher ground to the west of the towns, of these two towns. Now, as I said, I want to stress I haven't read the Wall Street Journal article myself. There's a limit to how many <laughs> neocon-oriented publications of the mainstream media I'm willing to take out subscriptions with. But anyway, um, I haven't read this article, but I've read um, um, accounts of it in multiple places, and I'm sure that I'm reported it reliably. If anybody thinks otherwise, please let me know. Um, and in any event, the logic of what apparently these military sources are telling the Wall Street Journal seems ir irrefutable to me. As I said, I know all the arguments that have been made about why Ukraine has been defending so obsessively in Bakhmut and Solidar. But I have never been able to see either the military logic or the humanitarian logic of doing so to the extent that has now been done.
And if it is indeed the case that Ukraine is having to rush reserves from places like the Chernigov Front in order to plug gaps in places like Bakhmut, then, of course, the logic becomes even more difficult to understand. It begins to seem as if Ukraine is intent on throwing away much of the best of its army in order to defend places that are ultimately undefendable and which are going to be lost. Anyway, that's what I think. As I said, I'm not a strategist. I've never pretended to be. Um, perhaps there are other military considerations here which I don't understand, but that's the overall sense of the situation on the battlefield in Bakhmut that I'm getting, and that's my perspective of what is going on. In summary, it looks to me as if the Russians are just tidying up now in Solidar. I think that they will be able to consolidate their positions there. I think that any Ukrainian counterattack in Solidar is almost certain, is almost guaranteed to fail. I mean, I'm not discounting, I'm not saying that there is no possibility of it succeeding. After all, from London, how can I know the position? And I'm not an expert in these matters anyway. But I, it, it would be so contrary to the whole drift of this battle that I can't really see it happening. And I have to say that. And if it is indeed the case that Opit Neue has also fallen, which I believe is likely, and if the situation altogether is starting to break down, then Ukraine has an operational crisis in the Bakhmut uh, Solidar area. And instead of reinforcing failure, it should do what the Russians successfully did following the Kharkov counteroffensive, which is pull back and preserve their troops, and what the Russians also did following the Kherson counteroffensive, which is pull back and res res and preserve their troops rather than throw their lives away in hopeless defense and fruitless counterattack. That is my own interpretation of the fighting. Now, there's a lot more to say about this um, situation in Ukraine. And the first topic I'm going to come to is news that came through yesterday of the reshuffling of the Russian command. Now, over the last three months, the person in overall charge of the battlefields in Ukraine has been General Surovikin, and I have been discussing him extensively on these programs. I've discussed how he organized a successful withdrawal from Kherson region, west of the um, Dnieper River, how he seems to have presided over the construction of these huge defence lines in Zaporozhye and um, around Kremenaya Svatovo. Uh, he seems to have successfully um, stabilised the front lines from a Russian point of view and how he has been also grinding the Ukrainians down, as he said he would, in the fighting along the entire battlefronts, but most specifically in the fighting of Bakhmut and Svartovo. Well, yesterday came the news that the Russians have reshuffled the command and that General Surovikin is no longer the overall commander of the Russian forces fighting in Ukraine. Um, the overall commander is now General Valery Gerasimov, who is also the chief of the Russian general staff. And predictably, um, this has produced a flurry of commentary and media reports. Now, Western re media reports basically have one particular theme. And can I say before I focus on this, that from their point of view, this Russian army reshuffle has come like manna from heaven because it's enabled them to discuss something else 
than the Ukrainian defeat in Solidar. So I think a headline in the Financial Times gives basic feel for the way in which the Western media has been spinning this. Russia demotes General Armageddon, that's General Surovikin, though I understand that his nickname in Russian is not Armageddon, but never mind. Russia demotes General Armageddon after battlefield failures. Which battlefield failures <laughs> is the Guardian, is the Financial Times referring to? I mean, it's an odd headline coming directly after the collapse of Ukrainian defences in Solidar, which by any definition is a Russian victory. Does that, is that a reference to the Kherson withdrawal? Well, there's been an accumulation of reports, including one from the Ministry of Defence, the British Ministry of Defence, saying that this was an operation which the Russians carried out in good order, and I've discussed that, and anyway, it happened weeks ago. And General Surovikin, of course, was decorated by President Putin himself over the course of President Putin's visit in December to the Russian military headquarters in um, the battle area uh, back in December. And that, of course, came after the Kherson withdrawal. So what are these battlefield failures that supposedly caused General Surovikin's um, demotion? Has he even been demoted? Now, the Russian announcement is actually um, fairly um, clear. It uh, sp speaks of the uh, Russians having appointed General Gerasimov, overall commander, and um, Surovikin is listed first amongst um, Gerasimov's deputies, so he's still there, as is the commander of Russia's ground forces, who's just, by the way, had General Lapin appointed his chief of staff, and another officer, General Kim, who is the deputy chief of the general staff, has also been appointed as another of General Gerasimov's deputies um, in, this, um, in this command group. Now, notice that Gerasimov remains chief of the general staff and General Kim remains chief of the general staff. And the most curious thing for me about this announcement is that Surovikin himself remains chief of Russia's aerospace forces. This is a combined force that includes Russia, the Russian Air Force, though it should be said that Surovikin, his background is in the ground forces rather than the, aeros the Air Force. He's never himself been a pilot or anything like that. Now, I'd assumed, and one gets, makes lots of assumptions, and sometimes they turn out to be wrong, that when General Surovikin was appointed the theater commander, um, commander of the Ukrainian, the Russian forces, the overall forces in this war, uh, back in October, that he was stepping down from his then position as head of the aerospace forces. Well, it turns out otherwise. It seems that he has held on to that post and he continues to. So I'm going to say now that I think that Western commentary is getting this entirely wrong. I think that far from Surovikin being demoted, and I should say that he's been referenced here as the first of Gerasimov's deputies. So the list of deputies is Gerasimov, Surovikin, the head of the army, and then the 
Deputy Chief of the General Staff. So Surovikin appears to have give, been given precedence. Anyway, it looks as if what has happened is that the Chief of the General Staff is now stepping in one, now that Surovikin has done the main part of his job, successfully stabilised the front lines, successfully carried out the withdrawal from the West Bank in Kherson region, successfully ground down the Ukrainians in Bakhmut. So what does that mean? What does it mean? Why has General Gerasimov, who is, by the way, and always has been at all times, General Surovikin's superior, why is the chief of the general staff, the man who is the senior military officer in the entire Russian armed forces, why is he taking direct control of the war? Why is he being on top of all his other duties, involving himself directly in military decision-making. Well, I'm going to venture a guess. It's only a guess because, of course, I don't know all that passes um, within the Russian command system. But my guess is that the reason Gerasimov is taking over, now that, as I said, Suravikin has stabilised the front lines, is because we're going to see at some point over the next few weeks a major offensive being launched involving all branches of the Russian armed forces in a very complicated operation. And that will need the entire resources of the Russian general staff to execute effectively, which is why Gerasimov is now taking direct control. Now, that's my own reading of this. Others, of course, will read this differently. Um, there's been conflicting um, opinions expressed in Russia, by the way, as a result of these appointments, especially given the fact that Surovikin has become something of a folk hero in Russia over the last few, week, few weeks. But anyway, one way or the other, we'll see what happens but for the moment, that is my own take. Now, I ought to say that um, at some point after I have made this video, um, there's going to be a live stream um, on the Duran with um, myself and Alex Christoforou, my colleague, and also Larry Johnson, who is a former CIA analyst. He also is of the view that General Gerasimov's appointment, far from being a sign that things are going badly, is a sign that the Russians are moving on to the next phase, if you like, um, which will be an offensive one, um, and probably on a big scale. I'm sure we will be discussing this in much more depth over the course of the live stream. If you want more opinions and discussions about this, well, wait until you see that live stream, assuming, of course, that the live stream doesn't happen um, um, uh, uh, before this video is published, which is something which is sometimes not fully in our control. Anyway, just passing on from that. Um, whilst I'm on this topic, um, I wanted to say something about um, some commentary provided by a very um, insightful analyst um, who um, writes about military operations, Russian military operations in Ukraine. I don't know much about his background, I don't know if I owe anything about his background, though I believe he is Russian, that he writes perfect English, and he goes by the name of Big Serge. Anyway, Big Serge has provided a very interesting Twitter threat. Uh, thread in which he discusses the various operational options that the Russians have. And he's mentioned the possibility of a Russian strike um, towards Kupiansk and Izium. And he links that to the Russian offensive in Donbass. He also talks about a possible Ru Russian offensive from Zaporozhye. 
And then he also looks at other options like Russian advances from Belarus and towards Volhynia um, in western Ukraine and towards Kiev. Well, I'm not going to go over these discussions. As I said, they were very, very interesting. But one point that Big Serge did make, which I think, again, perhaps needs to be emphasized, is that it seems that most of the fighting in and around Bakhmut is not being conducted by the Russian regular motorized or mechanized infantry. Now, the Russian military is present in Bakhmut. I discussed yesterday how there's been clearly some annoyance on the part of the Russian Ministry of Defense at the way in which Prigozhin, on behalf of the Wagner organization, seems to be trying to take all the credit for the victory in Solidar. But there are Russian troops there. Um, airborne troops have been certainly in operation in and around Solidar. And the Russians undoubtedly, the regular Russian military, undoubtedly provides a great deal of uh, support to the Wagner assault forces. But it's probably true, and this is a point Big Serge makes, that in Donbass still a great part of the fighting, perhaps the greater part of the fighting, continues to be carried out by various forces, by the Donbass militia, by the Wagner organization, who we've seen so much on in, in Bakhmut and Solidar, um, by the Russian paratroopers drawn from Russia's airborne forces, who obviously are not irregular troops, but they are, shall we say, light troops, and elsewhere in the fighting in um, Pav Pavlovka near Vugledar um, and such places, also by Russian naval infantry, Marines in other words, who are also, if you like, um, not perhaps, you know, mainline Russian troops. Russian tank forces, Russian motorized and mechanized infantry, heavy Russian infantry, have not really been very heavily involved in much of the fighting up to this point. This despite the fact that huge forces consisting of these heavy units are being gathered and enormous supplies of tanks, ammunition, probably, um, um, fuel, no doubt, are being stockpiled around in the immediate rear of the battlefronts. And by the way, the general staff, which General Gerasimov heads, will have played the absolutely key role in organizing all of that. So Big Serge makes the point that the Russians have huge forces assembling. Unlike the Ukrainian forces, these forces have been are building up in the rear. We've had all those 300 reservists, 80,000 volunteers who've joined them. Um, Larry Johnson, by the way, has made a very acute point that over the last couple of weeks, the Chechen fighters, who we know are present in the um, battlefronts, 9,000 of them, according to their leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, they also have disappeared from the front lines, which makes one wonder what they're being prepared for. Anyway, all of these forces have been assembling, and that does all point to something big coming. I'm not going to speculate or second guess Big Serge's ideas about movements and things like that. But anyway, something big almost certainly is on the way. Again, I'm not going to speculate about directions or dates, but it's understandable that given the, the scale of this thing, the senior military, senior military officer in the army, the man who's probably organizing principally the assembly of all of these troops, General Gerasimov himself, is now stepping in and taking direct charge. So 
That's what I wanted to say about the state of the battlefields at the moment. There's still obviously a very fluid situation going on. We'll see what the Ukrainians do, whether they do launch a counterattack, um, whether they whether that counterattack succeeds and recaptures Solidar. Um, I should say, by the way, in advance, that when Ukraine does launch counterattacks, sometimes it overstates their effect. I still remember how during the fighting in Severodonetsk back in the summer, um, the U Ukraine and various uh, Western media outlets talked about a successful Ukrainian counterattack in Severodonetsk that had largely recaptured the town from the Russians while the battle there was underway. It turned out that that was completely untrue. So, you know, be careful if you hear some reports to that effect. One always needs to wait for confirmation. But anyway, we'll see what happens over the next few days, though it seems to me that the trajectory of travel, if I can put it like that, is fairly clear. There are some other things I do now want to discuss. Firstly, um, John Helmer, who is, um, if I may say, one of the most um, interesting um, people discussing the war. He's um, perhaps the veteran or doyen of foreign correspondence in Moscow. He's been tracking Russian politics for, well, longer than anyone and has a knowledge of Russian affairs, which is extraordinarily deep. And who, by the way, I would also add, is somebody who has a much clearer understanding of military uh, structures in Russia, of the Stavka, than I do. Anyway, um, John Helmer has written an extremely interesting article on his website, Dancing with Bears, about certain comments that um, the uh, secretary, the head of Ru uh, Ukraine's um, Security Council, um, Alexei Danilov, has been making over the last couple of days. And this is what Danilov said and it's, so he said it on the 8th of Jan, January. And by the way, Helmer points out that Danilov himself is an Eastern Ukrainian. He comes from Lugansk. But anyway, this is what Danilov um, said. We are currently being offered the Korean scenario. This is the so-called conditional 38th parallel. Here are Ukrainians but their Ukrainians are not like that. The Russians will now invent anything. I know for sure that one of the options they can offer us is the 38th parallel. And Danilov then spoke about how a very prominent Russian official, Dmitry Kozak, who, by the way, was the Russian representative before the war in the so-called um, tripartite or contact group. He was supposedly the person who was trying to move forward the negotiations to implement the Minsk agreement. Anyway, Danilo says that Kozak has been busy. He says that Kozak, on behalf of the Russians, meets with former politicians in Europe and conveys through them the message that the Russians are ready to make concessions in order to fix the current status quo and force Ukraine to a truce. And um, then um, the idea is, apparently, um, that um, Kozak is traveling around Perhaps he's not traveling around. Perhaps he's meeting Western diplomats in Moscow and he's trying to get them to agree to a partition of Ukraine. Because when we're talk to, talking about the Korean um, example, that seems to be what it means. Um, Korea, um, after the Second World War and following the Korean War, was divided along the 38th parallel into North and South Korea, 
there's a demilitarized zone between the two and that supposedly is what Kozak is now proposing. Now, I have to say that um, I'm a little skeptical about this and so indeed is um, Helmer. And Helmer says this, Moscow sources suspect Danilov is attempting to relieve the pressure now growing on Ukrainian generals from the United States and NATO to consider an armistice before the Russians launch their anticipated general winter offensive. By exposing and trying to stand back the Americans, Danilov's remark is a signal that the real U.S. assessment is that a much bigger loss of military capacity, territory and viable out economy will be the outcome of the Russian offensive unless the Ukrainians buy time with a ceasefire and protracted armistice, armistice talks to commence. Now, Helmer then goes on to say that just as Danilov is not happy with this pressure that the Ukrainians are coming under from the West to try to enter into some kind of ceasefire negotiations, and he's spreading this story, the Russians would not be happy with such an outcome either. And um, he goes on to say, Moscow sources believe Danilo's signal indicates anxiety in Kiev, not only at the collapse of their front at Solidar and Bakhmut, but at the prospect of the following Russian offensive striking simultaneously from Sumy to Kharkov and Poltava in the center, around the E50 highway into, and in, into Dnepropetrovsk, that's the town Ukraine calls Dnepro, and in the south to blockade, um, to blockade um, Odessa. And uh, Helmer says, I've not seen a serious discussion in Moscow about a demilitarized zone at all. And um, this source apparently told Helmer that um, he or they believe that Danilov is reporting what the Americans um, have been telling Kiev. And another Russian source has told Helmer says another Russian source has told him Kozak has been de deactivated in Moscow since last July. That's why it makes all the more sense for the Ukrainians to refer to him and not to genuine negotiators, not to a credible Russian figure. D Danilov is attempting to refuse a proposal from a non-person. He and Zelensky are putting the Pentagon at that level. In other words, they're sending a message to Blinken, Sherman, that's the Deputy Secretary of State, and Newland or whomever the U Ukrainians think will save them from the US military pressure now. So the suggestion that's been made here, and I've no reason to doubt this, is that someone in Washington, in the Pentagon, is becoming increasingly nervous about developments on the Ukrainian battlefields and is telling the Ukrainians, for God's sake, try and negotiate a truce. We're not being entirely, we're not seeing this as the end to the war, but get yourself a truce, stop this Russian offensive in its tracks, so that we can then have more time to rearm you, because that seems to me to be um, the um, um, that seems to be the overall uh, thinking. And the Russians are entirely cynical about this. They also say, and this is again a Moscow source, Helmer reports a Moscow source, the Pentagon might want to fend off a Russian operation with a demilitarized zone, but the Ukrainians, the Germans and the State Department want to see the rearguard action because they believe they can exact a heavy loss of life on the Russians, on us. I'm convinced they don't want a demilitarized zone until the Russians fight their way to the borders of the regions they have already incorporated.
and uh, the, their perception is that the Russians will be too weak to take any more. They won't mind another meat grinder like Bakhmut. Well, I'm not going to go into that really distressing side of things. And then the Russian source says, this is all a lose-lose proposition for us, and that is why we have not heard this being discussed seriously. And this source then told, tells Helmer that what is needed is a Ukrainian capitulation. So the Russians are not interested in these negotiations. They see this as they see any proposal coming from the West or from the Ukrainians for an armistice as a ruse to buy Ukraine time. And the Ukrainians don't want to be pushed into a armistice idea either because, um, well, they feel that this kind of pressure on them is wrong and I suspect also, Helmut doesn't really talk about this, but I suspect also that any such agreement would encounter fierce political opposition in Kiev itself and would expose the Ukrainian government to immense criticism. So um, this whole thing that Danilov is talking about is it's not going to happen. There's no reality to it. The Russians aren't interested in it. The Ukrainians aren't interested in it. But the Danilov bringing it up in this way suggests that some pressure is coming on Ukraine to try to find some way out, some way of ending this war. Now, a lot of this, we don't know what exactly is going on, but I would say that Danilov did undoubtedly say the things that he did. This is irrefutable. These are public comments from Danilov, and it does look to me as if pressure is coming on Ukraine from some quarter, and I'm sure Helmer's probably got this right, that it's probably from some people within the military in the United States, some quarter to try and agree a truce before this offensive, this Russian offensive comes, which the Americans, or some Americans at least, fear is going to put Ukraine in an even worse position. Anyway, that's an interesting article from Helmer. It does give us some idea of some of the swirls and eddies that are taking place in the negotiations, in the discussions, in the secret meetings and conflabs that are constantly happening and which are, by the way, the feature of any war. Now, there's another thing I wanted to discuss, which is something that um, has been pointed out by Eve Smith, um, who is one of the most insightful economic commentators, um, writing principally, well, I think mainly now for Naked Capitalism. And it comes back to the topic of Bloomberg, because Bloomberg has now written a piece which says that um, Russian, the oil, the oil caps are having a further effect. They've pushed down the price of Ural's crude to $37.50, a 53% discount to Brent crude. And Eve Smith <laughs> has made this point, and it's irrefutable. It's not, I'm quoting her directly, now not what the market's sites say. Price of Ural's crude as of January 10th, equals $51.06. Thomson Reuters chart tracks the euro Brent spread and is more or less consistent. The page that shows Euros and Brent as an overlay has a lower price for Euros than the investing.com site. Investing.com is using a spot price whilst Nesta is using a five-day average. As you can see, Nesta has a uh, um, first of uh, um, one one eleven price, which is quite sure what that means, of forty six dollars eighty nine cents for euros, and no way, no how was the price in the thirties.
in the $30 range. And um, she says more um, about commenting on something I said on one of my programs. I'm not going to cover that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I am beginning to become very frustrated with Bloomberg. Um, they've been spreading now a whole series of stories, all of which seem to be intended to create the impression that Western sanctions are being more effective than they really are. We had the bogus story that um, Russian oil exports had collapsed by 54% in December. By the way, on that subject, there's just been a report from TASS, and it says revenues from the oil and gas industry to Russia's budget increased by 7.5% month on month in December 2022 and amounted to $13.5 billion, according to statistics from the Finance Ministry. In comparison with December 2021, this figure increased by 20, by 6%. Now, you know, I'm not sure how to assess those figures, but they don't seem to me consistent with the original, in fact, discredited um, Bloomberg story of a collapse of oil exports from Russia in December. And that's been refuted. Um, and we also had another report from Bloomberg a short time ago, which I spent some time discussing and showing that it's purely speculative about a supposed uh, how the supposed importance of military output um, in sustaining the entire Russian economy and this is the only reason why Russian industrial production figures appear to be holding up and how it was all supposedly financially unsustainable. And now we have this further story from Bloomberg, which straightforwardly gives a wrong price for the price at which Ural's crude is trading. Now, I have to say, I am becoming deeply frustrated about this. Um, I was one of those people who once upon a time long ago in another universe, as they say, imagined that Bloomberg um, was a reliable reporter, at least, at, least of the, at least of data. Perhaps not, you could argue with their commentary from time to time, but not surely with their data. It turns out otherwise. I am very, very sorry to see this. But I'm going to say straightforwardly, from this point onwards, anything you read about the Russian economy in Bloomberg, um, however much it's based upon what appear to be reliable figures, well, I, for one, am going to discount or ignore. There is now, I think, a consistent pattern from Bloomberg as I said, it, it upsets me. Uh, in fact, to some extent, it distresses me, given that, as I said, I was somebody who once upon a time took Bloomberg seriously. But we're now seeing a pattern emerge of Bloomberg reporting things which, quite frankly, are straightforwardly and entirely wrong in that specific area, data reporting, where they always used to claim to be especially reliable. So that's what I'm going to say about this article. And can I just say that Eve Smith is definitely someone everybody should read on her site, Naked, Naked Capitalism. I find her one of the best economic commentators around on any topic. <sighs> Lastly, <laughs> I'm now going to discuss an error that I made in my last video. Um, and I said in it, I think that um, all this talk about fragmenting Russia um, was wrong because in every Russian region, apart from Chechnya, Russians were a majority. Well, one particularly kind commentator, viewer, contacted me by email 
and has pointed out that this is simply wrong. There are, in fact, at least there are, in fact, two other regions that this person identified where Russians, ethnic Russians, are not a majority but a minority. These are Tuva. Tuva is a huge area, by the way, but it has a population of only 300,000. So I don't know how, how much significance we can attach to it. It's apparently a very beautiful place, by the way. Um, the other is Dagestan, which is another of the republics in the northern Caucasus. And I can add to those two Tatarstan, which you could say is in central Russia. Um, though Russians are a large minority there. Anyway, <laughs> those three regions. But overall, I still feel that my overall argument holds. Breaking up, fragmenting Russia in the way that those appalling articles and proposals that we see pouring out of the West make um, would be a massive tragedy. And given that Russians today are almost certain to resist it, I can't see how it can be done except through the application of enormous force. It would create an enormous area of instability in northern Eurasia and a potential crisis area for the world if it were to happen, which I don't believe, I'm absolutely sure in fact, it never will. It does, however, again, illustrate the mindset, as I've discussed in that my recent programme. Um, it does illustrate the mindset of the kind of people who think in this way. I would point out something else, by the way, which I didn't mention in this previous programme, that um, Russians, according to this mindset, are colonisers, never colonised. So... People in presumably Chechnya, Dagestan, Tatarstan, Tuva, wherever, in Russia, who are not Russians, are entitled to decolonization and the exercise of self-determination. But the exercise of self-determination by Russians in Ukraine, well, that is not to be allowed. That is, in some way or form, <laughs> a violation of fundamental, of the rules-based international order. Let's say that. Same, of course, applies to Serbs in Kosovo and Serbs in Bosnia and all sorts of other ethnicities around the world. This is a very selective approach to decolonization. Certainly, it doesn't apply to peoples in all sorts of other countries. I'm not going to name them. I don't feel I should. Um, it's seems to be much more a product of a hostility towards Russia than any realistic analysis. But it does perhaps illustrate the extent of that hostility and, well, frankly, the cynicism with which it is sometimes argued. Now, it has been a long video. I'm not going to... Uh, this is the point where I stop. Um, and I hope, again, it's been useful in some ways. Thank you um, for bearing with me. And, of course, there'll be more from me soon as the situation around Solida and Bakhmut evolves. In the meantime, let me remind you again that you can find us on multiple platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. You can also support us via Patreon and Subscribe Star. Links under this video, and you can you should check out. Remember to check out our shop, all the various things that you will find there: um, um, uh, mug, magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this program, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Well, thank you again and more from me soon, and I look forward to you joining me as these dramatic events um, as take place uh, as we see history, if you like, being made.